Okay. Um, so again, welcome. Uh, today we're going to be talking about 3D printing and design. Again, this is going to be uh, kind of an adventure trying to figure out how to do this over virtual, but luckily uh, the majority of the design stuff is done on the computer and it is through a free program that's web-based, so you don't even have to download anything, which is good. Um, obviously, the 3D printing aspect is going to be a little bit more difficult since we're not physically allowed on campus, uh, but that just means that you will have the opportunity to, um, you know, 3D to print whatever you design during this workshop uh, once we actually are allowed on campus again. Uh, so I'll show you how to do that towards the end. Okay, so the first thing is, what is 3D printing? I'm sure most of you know the gist of it, but it's essentially just converting a 3D model uh, that is computer-based into something physical. Uh, there are a couple different types of 3D printers. The two that we have in the makerspace in the library are um, an FDM printer, which is this one that's printing the uh, rocket right there. Um, and that's essentially like a large glue gun where it just kind of does the layer on layer um, in order to build the object. Uh, but we do have another type, which is the other side that has the kind of um, inverted Eiffel Tower. And that is uh, an SLA printer. It's resin that, it's liquid resin that is hardened by UV lasers. Um, so each layer has like a little laser and it um, flashes at it. It hardens the resin and then it sort of prints upside down, which is why the uh, Eiffel Tower is kind of coming up out of this weird uh, little print bed upside down. Um, but that being said, very, very cool technology. It's really fun to watch. Uh, you can see the laser kind of working. It's like a lime green kind of thing. And uh, then it just kind of creates it. It's pretty awesome. Uh, so these are the types of printers that we have. Uh, I just mentioned the resin printer. You can see it off to the side. Uh, it's definitely one of the best printers that we have, if not the best, purely based off of um, how detailed the print can be. Uh, some people don't really think about this, but 3D printing is very similar to taking a physical picture. Uh, what I mean by that is if you take a picture, and your camera is like a low resolution, and it's gonna turn out kind of blurry. Uh, the same kind of goes for 3D printing. You can have different resolutions. So as you're 3D printing something, it might not look the same on one 3D printer as it would on another. And that's simply because uh, depending on how a number of factors, like how fast it's printing, how large the layer type is, um, or wide rather, um, you know, there and they do have their own resolution. So some of them will look more smooth than others. Some of them will have issues with, um, you know, gaps and things like that if the printer is not well maintained or if it's a low quality printer. Uh, but the thing about the resin printer, which makes it so great, is that it has almost a perfectly smooth uh, texture to it. It doesn't have any texture at all, basically because it is made with that UV light that hardens one layer at a time and you can't see the layers once you actually take it off the bed. Unlike the FDM printers, which still look great, but also do kind of have a more obvious uh, layering, uh, which you'll see, I'll show you kind of a picture of it later, um, but not to say they're not good printers, they definitely are, but they're not gonna give you that like ultra smooth like the resin will. Um, but, as I said, these are good printers. I have gone through a load of trial and error trying to find really good ones for everyone. I have practically a 3D printer graveyard going on in my office uh, from like failed printers from years and years ago that we thought would be great and then ended up not being great. But we have found ones that are consistently really good looking. Um, they print out, they make really good prints. They're easy to use. Um, and they basically have uh, pretty high quality for whatever you're trying to do. So uh, this first category is what I use for uh, the 3D prints that would say come out of this workshop or if you're doing something through education. Uh, basically we offer free 3D printing for um, classes and anything scholarly or academic related. So if you're working on a research project, then you can uh, count that as a class print and you can get it printed for free um, in the Inspire Maker Lab. 
if you do a personal print, that's perfectly fine too, but we do charge a little bit of money for that. Um, in this first category with the Ultimaker 3, um, S5, and the Fusion 3, those are our, um, our printers that we use for these free prints. And the reason for that is actually kind of a simple one. I can buy filament, which is the uh, material that makes the 3D print. I can purchase filament uh, at a cheaper rate for those printers because it doesn't require proprietary filament. So basically, um, it's easier for me to uh, procure less expensive filament in order to make those prints, which is why they're kind of on that printer. Um, they are, I guess you could call it a lower tier printer, but as I said before, we've been through a lot of trial and error, and these are really great quality printers. So it's not like you're going to be getting a a poor print if you use them. They're really great for prototyping. Um, they're good for, I put casual prints, and what I mean by that is like if you're trying to do like a figurine or something fun, um, they're really great for that. They don't really need a lot of sort of intensive detailing or anything like that. Um, they're just, they're a really good kind of baseline printer. And again, those are the two types that are free for academic printing. And if you want to use them for uh, personal print, again, that's totally fine too. And our kind of pricing for that is $2 for the first hour and then a dollar for every hour after that. And the reason that I charge by hour instead of like filament is because um, that helps us kind of gauge how long the printer is gonna be in use. And so um, it sort of makes more sense on our end to charge that way. And the right way that we end up charging is through your, um, App State account. So if you're a student, faculty, or staff member, uh, it'll charge through your account like uh, an overdue book fine. So if you, you know, had an overdue book fine through the library, it would go through our library system and then it would roll over into your account uh, through the university at large. And this is the same kind of thing. It's just basically we add in a little fee um, for uh, like I said, it's similar to an overdue book fine, and that's kind of how that works. The other category is um, our, they are our printers that are a little bit more intensive. And so all of the prints that are made on either of these printers, we do charge money for. And that's simply because, again, I have to have proprietary filament, which means I can only purchase filament from these particular companies, which is very tough because obviously they, um, they overcharge quite a bit. Um, but that being said, they also are the highest quality of printers that we have. So the first one, is, the white one is called a Stratasys U-Print. Um, it's really great. And something that's really interesting about that printer is that it actually has two types of filament that it uses to create a print. Um, one type is just the regular plastic material to make the print. Uh, but then it also is accompanied by something called just a dissolvable um, support filament. So ultimately, when you're printing something and it has an overhang to it, so say you're printing out a giraffe. Uh, well, giraffes have their, they have the long necks and then they have the head that juts out. With 3D printers, you can't print in midair. It just obviously would ruin the print, it wouldn't work. So what the 3D printer does is it actually kind of factors in its own version of how to uh, make something called a support. So it makes these a thin layer of material that it uses to build until it gets to what it actually needs to print. So if you're printing that giraffe head, you have a thin kind of tower that's um, underneath where the head will eventually be so that it can rest, the head when it's being printed can rest on that support filament. Um, under normal circumstances, so in the first category of printers, the Ultimaker 3, the Fusion 3, um, they also do support filament, but what you would do is you would take tweezers and kind of tear that filament, that support filament off. Like I said, it's a very thin layer, so it's meant to be kind of ripped away once it's um, not being used to actually help support making the print anymore. Um, but Something that's really interesting about the Stratasys U-Print is it has that dissolvable filament. So instead of having to rip it away with tweezers, which can be difficult if you're having a more detailed print, um, you can actually take this print, stick it in a, well, I like to say it's an acid bath. It's not really, but it kind of helps um, 
with the picture of it more. Uh, but basically, you stick it in this acid bath and the support filaments dissolve off. So you don't need to spend that time with the tweezers um, kind of ripping it off uh, or you know sanding or whatever, something like that. Uh, and what makes that really great is that it helps if you have a more detailed print that you need to do. So say you're making um, an ornament, you know how they have like the ball ornaments. Well, you can't make a complete ball without having support in the middle of that ball if you're trying to make it hollow. So this would be a great use of that because when you stuck the uh, kind of ball ornament into the acid bath, all of the filament would dissolve out of that small hole. Whereas if you tried to print it on the Ultimaker 3, for instance, you might not be able to get the tweezers in to rip all of that, that filament out. Uh, so that is something great about the Stratasys. Uh, but, and then also with the resin printer, again, it just has really high quality uh, prints. And since it's made with liquid resin, liquid resin is expensive. So that's why we kind of have um, those issues. That being said, if you're doing something really, really detailed or something functional, so if you are printing a part to like uh, help your car, like something with your car engine, obviously you want that to be high quality. So these would be the, the printer options that you would want. Um, the Stratasys U-Print is about $10 per cubic inch. Um, it ends up being a bit less than that. Uh, we kind of guesstimate based off the size and detailing of the print. Um, but there's also less of a weight. So if you need something in a hurry, that's a good one to use. Uh, the resin printer is, like I said, much more expensive. Um, I'm pretty sure right now I have it as uh, $15 for the first hour and then $2 for every hour after that. And again, that's just because the liquid resin is insanely expensive. I had this thing happen a year or two ago where one of my coworkers brought in his Siberian Husky, pure white, very beautiful dog. She's gorgeous. Um, but I had a carton of liquid resin kind of sitting on a counter and she got away from my coworker and the, the dog was running around. And before I knew it, she was covered in black resin and left black resin paw prints everywhere and wasted like $70 of, uh, of resin. And so um, I'm very conscious of how expensive that is now. And I have those lovely paw prints all over our office to kind of remind me of that. Uh, so that's just kind of a fun aside, but true as to why it costs so much money to use. Um, but that being said, uh, the resin printer is our best printer. So now, now you know what the options are, but you kind of have to go back to the beginning and figure out how to actually get a 3D model. There are a bunch of ways to get this. Uh, so I'm gonna go through a couple of the most popular ways and then we're actually gonna design our own 3D model. So uh, you'll get that experience. Uh, something to think about are 3D model repositories. So these are these really great websites that have 3D models that people have already created that you can go and look at and use. Um, Thingiverse is by far the most popular, uh, but there's also Umagine, Autodesk, Colt 3D. Um, Thingiverse, like I said, it's the biggest one. Uh, it's really great, I'm gonna show it to you right now. Uh, so this is what Thingiverse looks like. They actually just recently did a redesign, which is kind of cool. Um, so it, if you'd been to, three, or to Thingiverse before, um, having taken this workshop. Uh, it definitely looked different a couple of weeks ago, um, but this is good because I was kind of worried for a little bit since MakerBot bought it that um, it was going to go away, but luckily that is not the case, so yay. Um, but Thingiverse is really awesome because basically you can search for all sorts of different things and you just see all these really interesting things that people have come up with and the best thing about Thingiverse is that it's all under a Creative Commons license. So anything that people put up on there, including you, uh, you can download for free. You just kind of have to attribute it to whoever did it. Um, so I'm gonna look at this Baby Yoda for a second. I'm just gonna open it right there in the other tab, but I'm gonna search Thingiverse. So let's search it for Harry Potter. And as you can see, there are tons of options of things that people have made related to Harry Potter. Um, you can see like wands and figurines and whatever. 
And not all of it is going to be 3D printed, by the way. Some of this is laser cut stuff, which is kind of cool. But you can kind of just go through and see what people have created. It's really interesting. Uh, you can also do something really simple. We're going to be creating a box in a few minutes. So I'm just going to search for box. And you can see all the different types of boxes that people have made. So some people do like trick boxes, um, heart-shaped box. Uh, you know, it's, it's really open to interpretation. Um, I love this Tudor Rose box here. I think it's very cool. Um, so yeah, basically you have all of these options here. I'm going to click on the Tudor Rose box just to give you an idea of what it looks like. Uh, so this was created quite a while ago. You can see what the, fin uh, the finished product looks like. Um, and then you can also kind of see what each element looks like. These are all 3D models, so you can all uh, download them all and then 3D print them. Uh, so no laser cutting here. But that's just an example. So it shows you all the different models and what they look like. Um, you can actually go and see what the author wrote. Um, they kind of give you suggestions. They tell you what they did. Some people are more detailed than others. You'll see that. And then some, like this person, wrote instructions on how to assemble it once it's printed, which is always really nice. Uh, if you go up here to where it says 10 thing files and you click on that, you have each of the files here. You'll notice that they all have STL next to them. Uh, that's great. That is the file format that you want for 3D printing. Um, it's what makes the uh, printer, it's easier for that, the printing software to, to read. It's easier to upload into various programs to manipulate. Um, STL is kind of the way to go. You also can see where people have made it. Um, so they kind of show where they've made it. And then you also have this really great thing that I love very much called remixes. So you can see how 16 people did a remix of it. And what a remix is, is this really awesome thing about Creative Commons licenses where you can actually take a model and then you can manipulate it on your own and then re-upload it. Since it's under that Creative Commons license, you can take the base of what someone's done and then you can enhance it or you can change it for whatever you need. So some people uh, like with this, they modified it to make it into a lamp, which is really cool. Uh, this one, they kind of made it a, a different um, kind of thing inside it to hold rings, things like that. It's, it's like I said, there's lots of different options that you can do. And the reason that I bring this up is because if you're new to 3D design, if you're new to 3D printing, this can be a great place to start. So you can go up here and do something like, um, let's see, not name, uh, let's see, uh, ID holder, something like that. You can find something really simple like this. Uh, so this is an ID holder. It looks like it's part of a cell phone case maybe. Uh, you can download that and then you can like customize it by putting your name on it or something like that. So you have these options if you don't want to start from scratch. You can see what Thingiverse has and then work from there. I am going to look at this cute little baby Yoda and it's going to come back in handy. So it says two thing files. Let's see. All right. Going to use the STL one. So I'm just going to download that right quick. Hello. All right. So again, we'll come back to that later. Um, there are, like I said, Thingiverse is the largest one, but there's also Umagine. Um, so Umagine is very similar. It's just owned by Ultimaker, so it's owned by a different company than Thingiverse. Uh, and then there's something called Colts 3D, which is, again, just another repository. Um, something to note, though, is I'm pretty sure Umagine and definitely Colts 3D, not all of these are free under the Creative Commons license. So you can see how this, someone has designed an octopus lamp, but it's $20 for the design. Um, so just something to keep in mind. Thingiverse is completely Creative Commons. Colts is not, although I will say that they do have um, sections where you can go for, uh, to see free things. All right, so we're going to go back here. Gosh, why can't I do things right now? There we go. Okay, um, so again, if you don't want to start from scratch, this is a great um, kind of resource for you to use. It's also nice if you have something in mind and you just want to print something for fun. Um, like some people have printed, you know, figurines uh, like cats and things like that. You have those options. 
Uh, the option that we're going to utilize today is actually creating your own 3D model. So you can fuse this, like I said, with the 3D repository stuff where you can download a model and modify it. Um, or you can just start from scratch, create your own. 3D modeling tends to intimidate a lot of people, but I promise it's not hard, especially if you start with like the easiest stuff and that's what we're gonna start with. Um, so we have over here Tinkercad. Uh, that is what we're gonna use uh, today. It is a very simple program. It's free, it's web-based. All you really have to do is just sign up for an Autodesk account, which takes a couple of seconds. So we'll do that in a second. Um, and that is uh, this, uh, picture down in the corner that has the Belk library stuff. Uh, that's stuff that I made like years ago in Tinkercad, um, but you can kind of see what you can do just within Tinkercad itself. It's not going to get everything that you would want out of a 3D design program, uh, but it definitely will teach you the basics of 3D design, help you get oriented to designing in three dimensions, which actually is kind of difficult if you're used to uh, you know, using Photoshop or Illustrator, because adding that third dimension can kind of be tricky. Um, but it's a really simplistic program. Most people can learn it in under an hour. And like I said, we're going to um, explore that in a little bit. And you can basically get most of the really simple things that you want to get done, done in Tinkercad. That being said, if you have something a little bit more intense that you're interested in doing, you can also kind of move, um, you can progress to more difficult programs. So Fusion 360 is a really great um, intermediate program to use. It is free for three years under an educational license for students. I think faculty and staff can also apply for a license, uh, but they kind of grant it at their discretion. Um, so if you're interested in kind of pushing further than Tinkercad, you, you kind of master Tinkercad and you're like, oh, I'm ready for the next step. Fusion 360 is a great option for that. Um, after that, you have things like Rhino. Uh, there are Rhino licenses in, available on the library computers. Um, if you were to purchase a license, it is insanely expensive, would not recommend. Um, but if you want to come and use our licenses, you are more than welcome to do that. Rhino is an industry level program. It's what they teach in industrial design and in art. Um, so those departments kind of use Rhino um, as their standard. Uh, other programs that are on the same level as Rhino that you might have heard about are things like Autodesk um, or SolidWorks. Those are kind of some other famous um, programs again that are on that kind of professional level uh, and then but again there there is a large learning curve to that so I would never recommend just starting in Rhino bad idea you will get overwhelmed very quickly um, I would definitely recommend starting in and again Tinkercad and then moving your way up and then the last thing I like to mention is Blender, which is this program um, with Wallace and Gromit down in the corner. Um, and the reason I like to talk about Blender is because it's open source and I appreciate that. So if you're looking for a more um, intensive, complicated program that is faux free, uh, Blender is a great option. Uh, there is a large learning curve in Blender, um, but it does more than just 3D design. You can do 3D design, but if you're also into like video game design, things like that, you can do a lot of rendering in uh, Blender as well, which is cool. So again, I just like to mention it because it's open source, um, but it is one of the harder programs to learn. But now we're going to get to the nitty gritty. I've talked enough. So we're going to actually make a 3D model. Um, so the first thing I want you all to do is go to tinkercad.com. And uh, you should be able to uh, just kind of create your account right quick. Again, it doesn't take very long. And for some bizarre reason, um, I don't really understand why, uh, for some bizarre reason, they ask you um, for your birthday. They don't send you anything on your birthday. I don't know why they do it. Um, but when, when they ask for it, don't get weirded out. Um, that is just... Uh, a kind of what they ask for. So anyway, but I'm going to unmute you all so that if you have any questions, uh, you can, you know, let me know. Uh, but go ahead, go to tinkercad.com and do and sign up for it. Again, it's web based. So uh, you don't have to download anything like that. You just kind of have to create your your ID.
And how do we, um, since you're sharing your screen. Uh -huh. Oh, oh, do I need to stop sharing? Yeah, I mean, I don't think we can, I don't know. I don't think I can do it without, I don't know. I think you can press escape and then it should uh, minimize your screen. And then you can- I'm on a Mac, what should I be pressing? Uh, are you on an, a Mac that has a touch bar at the top? Yes. Okay, so there is an escape button um, at, on the touch bar, or there should be. Uh, do you see it? Um, yes. Okay, so if you click that, it should minimize my screen. Did it do that? Yes. Okay, so, yeah, so you should be able to, to do it that way. Do you recommend signing in with Google? Uh, it, it's up to you, really. I, and I use my App State account, so I signed in with Google. But um, it's it's whichever account you feel or whichever email you feel comfortable linking it with. Okay. Didn't really ask me, so I wonder if I already had a an account or something, but one less step. <laughs> uh, I'm ready to learn the moves. Woo! <laughs> okay, so does has everybody gotten to the website and kind of signed in? A lot of you are. Yes. Okay, awesome. Uh, so something that might happen for you guys is you'll be kicked into a training thing. Tinkercad sort of does its own training um, and it'll try to talk you through the features. Um, obviously I'm going to do that. So if you kind of go up to the corner, if you look at um, my screen again, if you go up to the corner, it has the Tinkercad um, icon right here. If you click that, it should show you something like the screen that I'm on right now, only obviously you won't have all of these uh, 3D models down here. But you should have something that says my recent designs and then a button that says create new design. And we are just gonna click create new design. It took me to learning the moves and there are shapes over here, but I didn't. Yeah, have... that that's the training module. So if you go up to the corner and click the Tinkercad icon, which is the one that says so, Tinkercad. Like the cube. Yeah, yeah, the little cube. Um, that should take you to that screen that I was on that has okay. the eight. I got it. Thanks. Okay. So your screen should look like this. Um, the first thing I'll point out is up in the corner, it's usually got a very bizarre name up here. I don't know where they come up with these names. They're so weird, um, but obviously you can go and change that. So I'm just going to change this to box five, uh, just because I have a number of other boxes that I've done. Um, but you can obviously, you know, name it whatever you want. You can do your name box, whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, but that is going to be the name of the STL that you're going to eventually download and then um, kind of hand over to us to 3D print for you. Uh, so after you've done that, uh, this is the basic overview of Tinkercad itself. Uh, so you see how it has this thing called a work plane just right here. Uh, and all that basically means is that is what uh, your shapes are going to be built onto. Uh, the work plane is where um, they're going to rest. You can manipulate the work plane um, and see different angles by kind of clicking this little cube and then moving it around. Uh, so you can see underneath the sides and whatever. And that's super important because as I mentioned, designing in 3D is much different than designing in 2D. 
And sometimes you'll be looking at it from one angle and you'll say to yourself, huh, that looks really awesome. And then you'll turn it around and it turns out that whatever you were doing is floating in a completely weird area and not exactly where you thought it was. Um, so very important to kind of do that. Uh, that being said, if you want to go back to the initial view that you had at the beginning, you can click this little thing that looks like a home. And when you scroll, uh, hover over it, it says home view. When you click it, it'll snap you back to the original thing. There's also the lovely zoom option, which you can uh, use with the plus and minus signs. Or you can, of course, scroll if you have a trackpad like that. It's up to you and what makes you feel comfortable. Uh, but those are kind of the basics of the actual work plane. Uh, when you actually go to start designing stuff, again, Tinkercad is designed to be a very simplistic program that can kind of get you started very quickly. So it has a bunch of shapes over here that are already sort of pre-made that you can uh, manipulate. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, so the first thing I want you to do is choose a shape that you want your box to be. I would recommend it having a flat part like the box or the cylinder um, or even the polygon uh, or the heart or the star. It just needs to have that kind of flat part on the top because that's going to be a lot easier for when we're actually trying to create the box. Uh, so I will go and do, let's see, I'll do the star. And the way you do it is you click on this star and then you just drag it over and drop it. Super easy. And there you have uh, an original star. Uh, something also to keep in mind with Tinkercad is that all of these measurements are going to be in millimeters. Uh, so when you kind of uh, have it, your object select, selected, you can see that it has this blue outline here. That means your object is selected. Um, if you click off, the blue outline will go away. Um, but if you click on it and then you see these white um, little boxes here, uh, you can hover over and see how big it is. So when it says 38, when it says 36, um, that is again in millimeters. If you're like me, where you uh, don't have the millimeter to inch uh, ratio kind of memorized, uh, then you can go and uh, do what I like to do, which is kind of a cheat and do millimeters to inches and Google has this handy dandy thing where you can do it. So if I want my box to be four inches, um, it would be 101 millimeters. So uh, I can change the dimensions of my box that way. So when you hover over this little corner, I'm going to hover over it and I'm just going to click this white box in the corner. It'll turn it red but you can see how I can move away and it won't uh, go away, uh, the, the measurements I mean. Uh, so you can go here and you can click on that and then put in 101 and then click enter and it'll change it. And again, you can do the same thing with the other side. So 101, enter, and there you have it. So again, to do that, all you have to do is kind of click the corner. I like to do the corner uh, because I think it's the easiest way to, to do it. Um, it'll turn it red and then you can click into the, um, already, the measurements that are already on there and put in what you want. The same can be done uh, with the depth of the object. So this is probably a pretty thin box right here. I, man I manipulated the view a little bit uh, so I can see the volume here, um, or I guess height here. Um, and as we did with the corner, you can also do that with this middle thing, this middle white box. You can click that red. And you see how it comes up and it has the arrows right here and it has the 10 millimeters? Okay, well that just means that um, between the work plane and the top of the object, um, it is 10 millimeters. So I'm going to go over here and I'll do a two inch box, I guess, and do 50 millimeters there. Make it a little taller. Okay. So that's going to be the base of our box. And again, you can choose any shape over here that you like. You can go with the classic box, the cylinder, whatever. But again, it is easier to do um, 
a shape that is flat, at least for your first time. If you want to experiment later and like try lobbing like the top of the cone off and making that into, you know, the lid or something like that, that's great. I definitely support that. Um, but just uh, for the sake of learning, it's probably easier to, to do with the flat shaped or the flat topped objects for right now. So once you have your basic object and it's the size that you want, um, now we're going to do something a little weird, but I promise it will make sense in the grand scheme of things. It's mostly to kind of keep your dimensions um, correct. So you're going to click on the shape. Again, make sure it has the blue outline. You can see the, you know, the box around it, that kind of thing. And then you're going to come up here and you're going to click copy or you can do control copy or command copy, whatever you're comfortable with, but you're gonna make a copy of your object and then you're going to paste it. And you're gonna do that twice. And the reason for that is because one of these is gonna become your lid and the other is gonna help you actually make the box. So uh, what do I mean by that? Well, when you click on your original object, you should have a little pop-up box right here that says shape. As you can see, it's yellow and it says solid. However, there's an option right next to it that says whole. The way that Tinkercad helps you make uh, projects is basically it allows you to sort of do subtractive creation. So if you want to get rid of something, you have to have another object that is made into a whole and then you group them together and it'll subtract it. Um, so I know it sounds kind of weird, so don't do anything yet. I'm gonna show you what I mean. Uh, so this used to be a solid. I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna make it into a hole. And then just for example's sake, I'm gonna kind of put it over here next to this other thing. Um, and you can kind of see where the hole is and you can see where the solid object is. So in order to activate the hole, um, I'm going to highlight both of them and you can do that by just, um, you know, dragging and selecting both objects um, or you can click on one and then click shift and hold it down and click on another and that should um, select both objects. And then you're going to go up here um, right above your shape menu here um, and it's got this weird sort of icon and it says group. And when you group it, that's what activates the hole. So I'm going to click this group icon. And you can see that the shape that was the hole is gone. And it took away part of the shape that was not a hole with it. And that's sort of how you make your holes. So again, don't do that. Um, I'm going to go back and get rid of that. So uh, I just went over here and did undo. And then I have my two shapes again. So you're probably thinking, well, wh why is that relevant right now? Well, typically boxes have places to put stuff. And right now this star is a solid object. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this hole and we are going to put it in this other star in order to form our actual box. So the way, the easiest way that I have found to do this is to, um, again, make these two copies of one another. So right now they're the exact same size. Um, that's good in a proportion uh, kind of perspective. And so what we're gonna do is just make this hole slightly smaller than the original object so that we can make the walls on the edge of the box. So the way to, that I do it, um, and, I, and you can do it two different ways. You can either, um, click like we did before and subtract however many, um, however many millimeters you want your wall to be, um, or you can click shift and you can drag it in. So but for uh, you know, exactness sake, if that's even a word, um, I'm gonna make it a three millimeter wall. So it's gonna be 98. And then I'm gonna go down here and do the same thing and click 98. Uh, but again, you could hold down shift and manipulate like this if you wanted to. It's just sort of up to you. Um, but that's just sort of what I'm going to do. So again, you should have your regular object, and then you should have your hole that is now slightly smaller 
than your original object. Um, the other thing about 3D design is that when you have an object selected, you can also see how there is a little tiny black kind of cone triangle thing right here. Uh, when you click that, you can lift it off where the work plane would be. And you can kind of see off to the side here um, where it says, you know, um, it has that little bar with the arrow that's going up and down. And that's showing how far off the work plane that it is. Um, and the reason we need to do this with our hole is because we want to create a bottom for our box. So it needs to be slightly off, um, off the work plane so that it, the, our original solid star has that bottom. Uh, so I am going to make that um, five millimeters is fine. You can see it over here. Same with the other thing. You can also manipulate it if you want to and just type in three and it'll be three um, millimeters off the work plane here. It doesn't matter. Uh, so again, we've, we have our hole, we have it slightly smaller, and then we have it slightly hovering off of our work plane. Once we have that, we're gonna actually kind of drag it over to make the box. Uh, as you can see, <laughs> this is not close to centered, but there's a great way that you can actually center your objects. Same with how we grouped earlier. I'm just going to drag and make sure I have both objects selected. But instead of going up here to the group icon, I'm gonna go over here to these little bars right here. It looks like a bar graph, um, but it's actually a line. And a line is really great because uh, it obviously can center your objects. And it's really nice because you can actually hover over um, and it'll turn red and it'll give you a preview of what the hovering would, what the action would look like. Um, but for our sake, we just need to make it, um, you know, centered. So I'm just gonna click the center here. Then I'm gonna click the center there. And there you go. I'm going to zoom in so you can see it just a little bit better. So you can see how I have the uh, wall here. And then when I move like this, you can also see how the object is, again, hovering just a couple of millimeters um, up out of the shape. And again, that is just so that you have the three millimeters on the bottom to make the bottom of your, your box. So. Again, to align, you just kind of um, select both objects and you go up to the align feature and then you can align it however which way that you need to. And then you can click off. Once you've done that, uh, select both objects again. And then you'll go up to that group feature that we talked about earlier to activate the whole. So when you click group, you can see that it has hollowed out the box. So you have your walls here, and then you have your bottom to your box. You can kind of see that on the bottom, solid still. So there you go. So I'm gonna do a check-in. How is everybody doing on that? You can put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself and talk if you would like. I just need an extra second because my star has like gone off of my work plane. <laughs> oh, no oh, worries. Okay. No worries. I uh, just want to make sure it's all on there. <laughs> like I said, sometimes it is uh, it, when you're trying to work in 3D, it can it can be so weird like you can act, like move it and then all of a sudden it's gone or lose where you're at and have to use the home view again or whatever um i will say just in general um definitely keep the size of your object within the barriers of the work plane that just makes it um easier plus the work plane is designed to be the size of a typical um uh like 3d printed 3D printed uh, or printer bed, so you don't want to make it too big to where you, you can't print it.
Okay, I'm here with you. Thanks. All right, awesome. So now that you have this, um, it's time to make your lid. So when you get more comfortable with uh, Tinkercad and you wanna kind of do more intense things, then uh, you'll be able to kind of make the lid that you want. So, but we're gonna make just a very simple one now for the sake of, um, you know, being able to show you some more features. Um, so we have this uh, other object, which again is the same size as our original uh, box. And so all we're gonna do here is we're just going to go to this middle um, white box here that has the height and then just make it however tall you want. Um, I'm just gonna do kind of a six millimeter lid. So you have that there. Um, this lid obviously is not gonna be very helpful. It's gonna slide right off. Um, but something that you can do to help is you can make a little icon on top of it to kind of help like you can lift it off using that thing. So what I'm going to do is go over to our basic shapes panel and I'll find something that I like that I think would be a good pull. So I'll go to this icosahedron thing. Definitely saying that wrong. So I just drag this over. It seems to be a good size. Um, and then I'll pull it over here. And again, you can do that thing where you align it. I'm going to move this up to the corner here for now. I'll move both of these over so you can kind of see it better. Um, but you can take this and uh, you can highlight them both and then align them. So it's semi in the middle there, supposedly. Um, you can also see how it's sort of uh, buried in this star. So just like we did with the hole, I'm going to select it and then just pull it up slightly to where it's uh, resting more on top of the star um, holder than inside of it. And then just like with the hole, instead of taking something away, you can highlight them both and then click the group and it will actually fuse them together. And if you don't like it, again, you can always undo it or you can select it and then ungroup it. And ungroup is right next to group. I'm also gonna change this into a different color. It has no meaning really to change it to a different color. Um, it just is sort of to help you figure out um, your, you know, help you organize the different elements of whatever you're creating. So I didn't really like this little thing that I would use to kind of pull the top off. So I'm going to do something else. Do you remember when we were looking at Thingiverse earlier and I saw that baby Yoda and I was like, wow, that baby Yoda's cute. So I would love to have baby Yoda sitting on top of my box. How cool would that be? So how do you do that? Well, I already downloaded Baby Yoda. So I'm gonna go up here to import. Uh, you can see how it has import, export, send to. Well, we're gonna do import right here. Then I'm gonna do choose a file. Uh, let's see, downloads, there we go, Baby Yoda. Oh, it's too large, okay, that's fine. I will go over here, find another one. See, that is one of the issues with um, Thingiverse, I mean, not Thingiverse, but Tinkercad, one of the limitations. Like I said, you can't do everything in Tinkercad. Um, and one of the limitations is that sometimes you can't import uh, certain things that are too big. Uh, so instead, I'll do a puppy. I'll choose this little puppy right here. He's cute. All right. Thing file. Download him. All right, so I'm going to kick back over and hopefully this will work better than Baby Yoda. There we go. Um, so when it says yes, you can upload it, you can do 100% scale and it'll tell you what the dimensions are going to be. Um, or you can manipulate it right there. So I'm going to go ahead and do 50% for dimensions just to make it slightly smaller. Um, that saves me a little time once it actually would be imported. 
uh, and then I'm going to click import and it'll say right here, it'll have like a little progress bar and sometimes it takes a little while, uh, but imports always show up in the very middle of the work plane. So if you can't see your import, it's probably because it's there and it's being covered by another object. Um, I have had that happen before, but here it is. Here's our little puppy. So cute. Um, so I'm going to do just like what I did earlier. Um, I'm going to highlight both of them. I'm going to do the align. So there he is right in the center of things. Um, and then I'm going to lift him up a little bit so that he's not in the middle of the star, but sitting kind of on top of the star. So cute. So this also kind of goes back to uh, what we talked about earlier with 3D model repositories, where if you want to take something and download it and kind of manipulate it for your own use, uh, you can do that. So I downloaded this puppy and I am gonna make him the star of this star box. I'm gonna group it right here. It'll take a second because it's um, an imported file, but you can import it. And uh, now I have repurposed this puppy and he will be sitting on top of this star box, which is kind of cool. So, uh, you know, you don't have to start from scratch. Like I said, you can go and find a file that you like and use it the way that you want to. It's just sort of up to you. So I've imported this puppy, very cute. Um, but you can also do other things within Tinkercad without having to actually import anything else. So we've primarily been looking at basic shapes here. Um, but you'll see that basic shapes, it has a little drop down menu and you can see a bunch of other things that they have here. Uh, so you can do text and numbers. So if you wanted to add your name to the box, uh, you could actually do that. Uh, so I'm going to turn this just a little bit. Okay. Um, and then once you highlight the text, uh, you can, it'll open a larger pop up shape um, window that has text. Uh, and so I'm going to just put in Hannah. Basic. Uh, it's got a couple of fonts built in, Ugh, not many. So it's, you know, you're limited there again. Uh, but, you know, it kind of has an option for you. Uh, you can also manipulate the height, um, that kind of thing, the bevel, you know, what you want. Um, and then just like with the other shapes, you can click the shift button and make it smaller, or you can hold down, or you can click the corner and then manipulate the size that way. Um, so I've, let's see, it's still a little bit big, so I'm gonna hold down the shift button and I'm gonna just move that in a little bit, okay? Uh, you can see how it's, it's small, it's um, short, so it's gonna be hidden in the, uh, kind of main body of the star. So just like we did with the puppy, I'm just gonna move it up a little bit uh, so that it's sitting on top. Then I'm gonna put it right there, okay? And again, you can zoom in and see what it would look like. See where it's, in, you know, how tall it is. That's, that's a little too tall, I think. Uh, nobody needs that. There we go. And just like you did with the puppy and the uh, top of the box, you can highlight it and then you can make it into one shape. And again, it'll take a second. And there you have it. You have your body of your box, your top of your box. Uh, but again, in addition to text and numbers, they also have other things. They have characters. So these are kind of funny. Uh, I don't know what some of their uses are, but I have had people in different workshops who end up using them. Um, and you can make any of these into holes. So if you wanted to use this, uh, this mustache here, I'm going to pull it up um, and I'm going to stick it on this star. Uh, as you can see, the star has an angled uh, sort of uh, like side here, and so it would be different than the mustache. So what you can do is use one of these turn things here. It's not a good angle for it. What's really not a good angle for it? That's cool. 
All right, fine. Sorry, it keeps trying to make me actually type it in, but I do not want to. <laughs> I want to just kind of move it myself. There we go. Um, so you can actually kind of move it like this, or you can type in the degree, whatever. Um, so I'm going to stick that there. Keep turning it a little bit. And again, this is just now I'm just showing you examples of stuff you can do. And just like with the other objects, you can turn it into a hole. So if I wanted to highlight both of these and then group them, then you can turn it into a hole. Oh, it didn't go all the way through. Push that back a little bit. See if you can see it Make it a little bit fatter. There we go. And that should have punched it out. Yep, there you go. You can make a punch out. You can add it on. You can do whatever you want. Do you have a mustache? you have an ice cream cone? Um, but there's a couple of other things you can see. If you're more engineering focused, they have these things called connectors. So you can solve things that way. Um, they have a new thing called making at home. Uh, this is quarantine fun right here, where people have created these very bizarre um, options that you can use. Uh, Lucky Penny, I don't know. Um, so yeah, so you have all these options. In addition to being able to download something from Thingiverse and then adding it that way. Uh, so for this workshop, uh, I don't expect you guys to finish your box. If you do, that's awesome. If you don't, that's totally understandable. You've been doing this for half an hour. Um, but feel free to play around with it. Um, you know, customize it how you want. If you find your first box is like not up to your standard, uh, you can always scrap it and then start over. It's really not difficult. Um, but if you're like, huh, that box is pretty good looking. I want to make it happen in real life, uh, then all you have to do is go up here to the export button. And you'll see how it has download um, for 3D print. And just like I mentioned earlier, you're going to want to choose this STL button right here. And when you click it, it will download it. And you'll see also um, that I have managed to fit both sides of my box onto one onto the work plane. Um, and then when you have this STL file and you send it to us for 3D printing, um, we can 3D print it on the print bed at the same time, which is very helpful for us. Uh, so go back here for just a second. Um, so we have our online Google form and that is how we typically do 3D printing. Again, since we're in this very weird, um, you know, quarantine time, we don't know when we're going to be getting back to the 3D printers themselves. Um, you are still more than welcome to use our Google form and send it in. Um, that being said, I cannot guarantee when it would be available. Since this is a workshop, uh, you do get to print this for free. It's considered academic because you're learning something new, which is cool. Um, so when you click on our online 3D re print request form, and you'll be, you can find this on our website, um, you can Google Belk Library 3D printing and it'll be, it'll pop up on like the first and the second link. Uh, you can kind of go to the Inspire Maker Lab part, portion of the website and find the form. You should be able to find it anywhere. Um, but it looks like this. Um, and all you have to do is kind of put your name, email address, Select class as what the print is for. Um, give a brief description of your project. So this is just if you had some sort of special instruction. Um, so you would say, you know, created a box for a workshop. And then, you know, if you needed like two boxes, you could say need to. Or um, if, if you're a little bit more into 3D printing and you've done kind of some more uh, detailed things into it. So you could be like, well, I want this number of infill or something like that. Um, infill is just how solid an object is. Uh, so, but that's just an example. And as I said, if you get really into 3D printing and you want to kind of get very specific, then that would be your area to, to put that instruction. 
then we ask uh, what, it, it, what your file name is and then are we allowed to uh, use your designs? And when we say use your designs, we essentially just mean uh, like for social media stuff, be like, oh, our Instagram looks awesome with this box that this person has made, like that kind of thing. Um, we don't really steal your intellectual property, uh, but I do give you this option. Yes, I would like to be credited for the design I created. So if so for this particular um, project, since you made most of the box, you could say, yes, of course. You could say, um, yes. You could say, no, I would rather not. It does not matter. Obviously, it doesn't count against you. Again, it's just for like, being able to show people the cool stuff that people are making. Um, but there is this fourth option. No, this is not my design. If you have downloaded something off of Thingiverse, if you have not modified it in any way, then you are gonna choose option number four. You would be surprised at how many people are like, yeah, you can use my design. And I'm like, this isn't yours. I know you got this off of Thingiverse. Yes, it's free because it's Creative Commons, but you still need to, um, give the attribution to the original artist. So again, if you just down something, download something straight off a of Thingiverse, you would say, no, this is not my design. If you did like what I did with the puppy, you download something down from Thingiverse and then you remix it onto the box, then you can say, yes, but I would like to be credited or yes, of course, because that has been, um, through the use of fair use, um, basically you have manipulated it enough to where it's created something else. Uh, finally, you have your 3D printer that you would choose. Um, you're gonna choose the one with the Rocktopus right here, uh, the Ultimaker 3 S5 Fusion 3. Uh, Cause again, as I mentioned earlier, that is our free 3D printing. So you'd select that. Then on the next page, that's where you just upload and submit the uh, STL file that you downloaded for the Thingiverse. Um, I will go back up to the top right here right quick. Um, I know it's a wall of text and I apologize. Um, typically, we would ask for at least three or two weeks to give you your 3D print. Again, since we're in this weird uh, kind of limbo, uh, it's hard to say. But typically, when we are running normally, it's about a two-week turnaround. And that's just because sometimes when it rains, it pours, and one 3D printer will get sick, and then all the others will somehow catch it. I don't know how it happens, but <laughs> sometimes we have issues like that. So that kind of gives us time to go through the queue and print things that are ahead of whatever you've submitted, um, and you know if we have to do some sort of maintenance. It also explains how you can get free 3D printing, which again, right here, attended a 3D printing workshop. That's you guys. Um, so it's feel free. Um, and then it has, again, just in case, I know I said I vocalized this to you earlier, but it has it written out that these are, are the pricing for our 3D printers. So if you wanted to do something personal, um, you know, it has those uh, prices. So you're not surprised about it, essentially. Um, and then we also, I, I have to say this, um, but we have the right to not print anything um, if we want, don't want to, uh, but we don't exercise that right typically. Uh, but if you do something considered illegal or profane, so like weapons, drug paraphernalia, um, et cetera, um, which I wouldn't have to mention it if it had not been attempted. Um, so we would not print any of that. An example is I actually had somebody who wanted to 3D print a part to assist a gun. It would not actually, um, it was some sort of like grip or something, but I still refused to print it because um, I, it would be assisting an actual weapon and that's against our policy. That being said, if you are a cosplayer and you want to, this is a true story as well, and you want to 3D print a Zelda sword, a replica of a, De a Zelda sword, um, you are welcome to do that because that is not going to hurt someone. It's printed in pieces. It will not be actually able to inflict damage. Uh, we also 3D printed a completely solid um, Han Solo blaster. So obviously you're not going to be able to hurt someone with a fictional weapon. So if so, we do have kind of those um, those slight uh, you know gives in what we can 3D print. We will not print any bongs or anything like that. Sorry. Um, my student workers are very diligent about catching that sort of thing. And then if you want more information about 3D printing in general, I have both the website and a guide. So this is our guide. Um, looks like this. Again, it has the link to the 3D print form. 
Um, it has the information about all of the 3D design stuff that we talked about earlier. So it has all of the links to the different programs I discussed. It has um, the links to the 3D model repositories that we talked about. Uh, and it has some extra books and stuff because I am still a librarian at the core of everything. And then it also has a little bit of information about 3D scanning, which we didn't talk about, but is another way, although to varying degrees of reliability, to get a 3D model. So um, you can do that. You can also go to uh, the Inspire Maker Lab guide, which has our information about 3D printing condensed here, um, but also has information about other stuff too. So electronics, uh, things like that. So if you're interested in other, uh, you know, maker technologies, then you are more than welcome to do that. Also has our feed to our Instagram. If you don't follow us on Instagram, I encourage you to do so. I don't spam, as you can see, this was six days ago, this was three weeks ago. So, um, you know, I try to, to be um, very sparing with the, the, uh, the social media presence. But that being said, it does have some cool stuff. So this right here, just a little plug, is one of my coworkers made a bunch of face shields, 3D printed a bunch of face shields and sent them to Boston where they are needed for the, the virus relief efforts right now. Um, so cool stuff like that also has inspiration for different projects. Um, so if you're interested, please follow us. Um, and then again, we also have um, the Falk Library 3D printing. Again, you can just Google that. And here we are, the very first link, and this takes you to our website on 3D printing. Um, sorry, I'm signed into the website, so it looks a little bit different than it would for you. Um, but you can see 3D printing. You can also go to our rooms and spaces and see the makerspace and uh, get some more information on that. So, yeah. Oh, I need to fix this. Good to know. Um, okay. So are there any questions or anything? Because we, I know we are a little bit past the hour. Um, I have a question about like color options when you do go to yeah. print. Mm -hmm. how, how do you do that? Okay, so uh, one of the great things about 3D printing is that uh, you don't, it does not matter what color it's printed in. Um, it matters on a structural level with the material. So we only offer three different colors and that's white, black, and gray. Um, and the reason that we do that is because, and you can't choose. Uh, they're all neutral, but the reason you do, we do that is because 3D printing takes very well to paint. So you can easily spray paint or use acrylic paint on anything that you 3D print. Um, so you can customize it that way. So like I said, the material color doesn't really matter uh, because ultimately you can paint it however you need it to look. And would those sometimes be mixed color, like mixed colors in there, white, gray, and black? No, it would typically be, I mean, not unless for some reason in the middle of your print, we ran out of one color and had to use another, okay. um, but that's very unusual. So I, I doubt that would happen. It typically is one of those three colors. And like I said, it just depends on which one is currently on the printer, which is typically up to me or my student workers. And it's just sort of, you know, whichever one's closest usually. Okay. Um, so yeah. Uh, Martha asked, can we get a copy of this recording? Um, yes, yes, I am going to, once I stop recording, um, I will probably end up putting it on, um, on uh, uh, our YouTube channel and then figure out what else, uh, where else we can kind of share it out. And I'll be doing the same thing with the uh, program that I'm doing next week, which is on laser cutting and designing for laser cutting. Uh, yes. Someone has their hand raised. Yes, I have a quick question. Uh, sure. so for that hole, uh, the mustache hole in the box, uh -huh. would it do some kind of support or is it just going to skip that shape gradually until it forms it? Um, so it actually depends on, um, on angles, uh, but luckily it's something you don't have to worry about because there's this program in order to get your file ready for 3D printing. It's called a slicing program. Okay. And my student workers or myself, we put it through that program and the program actually determines if it needs the supports or not. Okay. Um, so you just design the hard way and we do the rest. Perfect. Yeah. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions?
Thank okay. you. It was great. Oh, great. I'm so glad. Um, so again, I know it's hard not to be hands on and be able to walk around and see how everybody's progressing with their with their projects. Um, but if you have any questions, any lingering issues, um, I can try and help you as much as possible. Uh, Zoom actually has a remote control option where I can sort of remote into your computer and try to help you with the design if you would like that in a consultation capacity. Um, and if you wanna do that, again, you can just email me. Uh, my email is um, hopehl at appstate.edu. Uh, so feel free to get in contact with me if you have any further questions, or again, if you wanna do some sort of consultation, I'm happy to do that. Uh, we also are doing, again, a laser cutting workshop next Wednesday, same time. And that is going to be a little bit of Adobe Illustrator and teaching how to uh, design for a laser cutter, which is a little bit different than, um, obviously it's different than 3D, print, uh, 3D design, uh, but it's also different than you would think. Uh, so it's just kind of uh, some, uh, you learn a little bit about Adobe Illustrator and then you can actually kind of create a business card just as an example. You can also create whatever you want, obviously, um, that you could cut on our laser cutter once we are back on campus. Uh, so yeah, we have that available. All right, well, thank you guys so much for participating. Again, feel free to get in touch with me if you need anything. And um, thank you so much for attending the workshop. Thank you. Thanks Bye. a bunch. We thank appreciate you. It. Bye. 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 Hey, Hannah, I have a quick question. Sure, what's up? Um, 